court Jew is a term usually denotes Jewish, uh, Jewish courtiers in early modern Europe, mostly in the German states and the Habsburg Empire. In her seminal work on the subject, Selma Stern failed to relate to a similar phenomenon in Islamic countries. However, there were court Jews in North Africa, Morocco, as late as 19th century. Interestingly enough, even the most famous figures of the Sephardic diaspora, Don Agatzi Nasi and Don Yosef Nasi, uh, and later on Don uh, Shlomo Ibn Yaish, were never analyzed and appraised as core Jews by modern Jewish historiography. Others who deserve the title core Jews were never treated as such. I will relate to a certain group of Jews in, at the capital of the Ottoman Empire in a given period of time as core Jews per par excellence. Um, I would like to speak about their philanthropic activity and their motivations. This precarious yet coveted position as supplier of the army or the senior viziers emerged in the 17th century and existed until the 18, 1820s. It was highly dependent on a political network of dignitaries in the imperial court as well as as well as on economic network that provided funding and merchandise. The Jews to whom I refer filled a similar role to that of European peers, suppliers of the army and the court. The Ottoman Jewish courtiers dedicated time and money and used their influence in order to assist Jewish communities. They also used their political power to enhance their wealth and influence within the Jewish community. But at the same time, cleverly exploited communal resources in a very sophisticated way to maintain their businesses. In addition, they emerge as important new players in the communal sphere. I question their motivations concerning philanthropic actions. In my view, these businessmen made utilitarian decisions concerning tzedakah, uh, charity, motivated by money and power rather than by pure philanthropic solidarity or religious sentiment, as we tend to assume when pondering on Jewish history. When referring to Jewish presence in the imperial court, we can apparently discern between two periods. The first, which spans from the 15th century to the 18th century, uh, in which some dominant, uh, to, sorry, to the 17th century, in which dominant figures were mainly physicians, such as Yaakov, uh, of which the late Bernard Lewis wrote uh, and lived in the late 15th century, Moshe Hamon, of which uh, Moshe, uh, Haid wrote uh, more than two articles, Shlomo Ashkenazi, who was also a diplomat, Moshe Abravanel, Israel Corneliano, and Tuvia Katz. At times, some of them uh, carried out diplomatic missions, as I said before, for the sublime port. Lists of court doctors indicate that a tendency of reduction in the number of uh, these Jews uh, in this capacity within the hierarchy of court doctors uh, so that the number of chief physicians or those who attended the Sultan himself declined considerably dur during the 17th century. The second period begins in the 17th century and ends around 1826. During the 17th century, a new type of a courtier rose to power, a merchant, purveyor, and at times a financier. The Jewish purveyor gradually became a member of a narrow circle of elite within the Jewish community. Around 1700, Castiel, Sasson Chaylevet Castiel, an Istanbuli Jewish merchant of precious stones claims that Hamon, Uziel, Rosanes, and Shonsin, and I quote, are the four rich families in Istanbul who meet the Sultan privately and he said literally see the face of the Sultan. And then he goes on and said that they are so influential that he fulfills all their wishes. Who were these people if not uh, such uh, uh, court suppliers, important court suppliers? The new court Jew earned his living as a purveyor for viziers and high dignitaries, a general purveyor, agent, or factor who managed all purchases for a household, household was not the only possibility. Other sources mentioned Jews who dealt in more specific luxury commodities, such as important fabrics, uh, precious stones and jewelry, and perfumes. Official uh, documents stored in the state uh, archives, the Bashpal Kanil Shavi, also mentioned Jews as chief suppliers of perfumes and spices to the imperial court. Time and again, European travelers mentioned that each governor and each grandee in the empire has a Jew who manages his financial matters. These are French, Italian, uh, and British, and even German uh, uh, travelers who say the same thing. Many of them brought, they say, these governors brought their Jew with them from the capital or from another city where they had been posted until then. Thus, for example, we know of a whole line of Jewish sarafs in Cairo, among them, were Rafael Yosef Chalebi, Yosef de Leon, Elias Leon Zafiropich, uh, Mina Rosen wrote, 
In Syria, Palestine, we know of Chaim Fauhi, who was active mostly in Acre and Damascus, and in Baghdad and Mosul until the 1830s, the head of the Jewish community customarily served as a saraf of a governor. Now the Bazargans. Ever since the 15th century, members of Istanbul's Jewish community has had various dealings with the imperial court as physicians, musicians, and other entertainers, suppliers of rare goods, and tax collectors. Among those suppliers and merchants, we can find since the late 17th century a distinct group, Jew Jews who filled the position of Bazargan Bashi, of the, that is Bazargan of the Janissaries, uh, the chief suppliers of the army, horses, camels, weapons, gunpowder, powder, tents, food, tobacco, and clothing. Very few families, almost always connected by marriage, were able to fill this function. It required political patronage as well as extensive funds or at least credit, ramified business connections, and of course, luck. The position was dangerous since one could easily lose his patron and his head, uh, being unable to continue financial juggling or suffer continuous intrigues by rivals and uh, envious people. Yet despite the danger of death and con confiscation of one's fortune, this lucrative uh, business was so attractive that even when a person was executed by order of the Sultan or the Grand Vizier, his own children and or other relatives replaced him as soon as possible. This, for example, was the case of David Zonana, perhaps the most famous Bazargan. In an enlightening uh, article, Onik Janjogojian uh, reconstructed the career of a typical Armenian Bazargan in Saraf, Serpos, who was active between uh, 1718 and 1755, until he was executed by order of the Grand Vizier and his fortune confiscated by the treasury. It seems that Armenians had a similar talent for financial matters, forgive me, as well as similar and even greater and wider economic network which, which are vital for this job. It is not surprising that both Jews and Armenians, who were anyhow constant business rivals, competed on the access to these posts, wishing to become purveyors for the Grand Vizier, the Kislag Asi, or the Ah of the Janissaries. Once acquired a post, the winner hurried to purge the whole system and replace those related to the loser with his own people. These were not necessarily from among his uh, coreligionists. The courtiers wielded immense power within uh, their community and were benevolent and generous, but also self-centered, tyrannical at times, and were eager to dictate and make things work for their own good or to the benefit of their protégés. Very much like the Jews, Armenian, Armenian notables bearing the titles Amira were also involved in communal matters, donated funds for charitable purposes, helped to attain permits to rebuild houses of prayer, intervened directly or indirectly in the appointment of religious leaders, and looked after the brethren and institutions in Palestine. If we can speak about the history of the institution of the Jewish Bazargan and draw some out outline of a collective biography, it is mostly thanks to the work of Shuki Eker in his uh, very detailed dissertation. The Jewish Bazargans of the Janissary Corps whom we can trace only from the late 17th century and continue to exist until the end of the period, marked by the annihilation of the Janissaries in 1826, might be related to as core Jews par excellence. Ekel showed how this office evolved during the late 17th century and traced the entire chain of Bazargans as well as their philanthropic activity. Indeed, we know that many Jews operated at Sarafs and Bazargans, suppliers of the assortment of commodities to viziers, governors, and other dignitaries throughout the entire century. It is regarding the post of the Janissaries Bazargan that Ekel made a great and significant contribution, but he failed in analyzing their support, uh, supportively benevolent acts. In his analysis, Ekel had shown that the function of Bazargan crystallized and took shape during the first half of the 17th century and evolved in two phases one between 1650 and 1750, the formative period in which it, the, the office was consolidated. Well, I think it started around 1620, according to, to Hebrew sources, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and it shows how the whole, the whole uh, Ottoman system, uh, uh, the administration is, is changing, uh, allowing this uh, uh, phenomenon to, to, to become. The second period is between 1750 and around uh, 1850, the shift from purveyor suppliers to professional bankers. Ecker demonstrates the transformation from one function to another, the banker. 
This shift was also a response to changes in the Ottoman state and the growing need for credit, even more so due to the attempts at modernization and let, later on the actual changes in it, it entailed. The old type of Jewish Bazargan was about to disappear. The Sarafs and the Bazargans were wealthy and influential. They used their power and connections to enhance their status within the, their own community. They often also held the position of chief tax collectors of the Jewish community as a head and headed the Committee for Holy Cities in Palestine, Vat Kideyot Israel. <coughs> in these capacities, they handle huge sums of money, whether those amassed in Istanbul or those collected by emissaries throughout the Jewish diaspora and transferred to Istanbul to, in order to assist the Jewish communities in Palestine. The Jewish, the Jewish Bazargans used these funds and, as credit to finance their own needs, since the money was available and moreover free of any interest. Needless to say, these sources of cash money were very important and even vital to their role as purveyors and suppliers, and later also as bankers, especially when money became scarce after the wars that began in the 1760s. I cannot prove my assumption, at least not until we find their accounting books. Due to their status and their connections with, the Ottoman, with Ottoman dignitaries and the fact that they met sometimes on a daily basis some of the most powerful people in the court, these Jews wielded enormous power within the local Jewish community. They did not really wish to take part in the communal management themselves, but they did use others to ensure the interest, that, that is, in, for example, in, in assessment of taxes, the election of communal leaders and rabbis, and well, as well as in the appointment of other office holders. The core Jews received pleas from many people who needed their connections at, and their ability to deal with material, uh, ma with various matters in the capital. These could be Jews, individuals, or, or communities from all over the empire, local Muslims who sought promotion, and also foreigners who sought a speedy audience with the Grand Vizier or other uh, dignitaries. The Bazargans and other Jewish courtiers formed a small group with many family and business ties between them, but this does not mean that there were not, there were not rivalries within this circle. We know that there were tensions and rivalries between families and even within a family. Often enough, Jews in powerful positions belong to different networks of intisav, that is, patronage networks. And uh, there are many examples uh, uh, to it. Uh, in the mid-17th century, we know about the uh, Ibn Yaish family uh, versus the Hamon and El Nekave families, and, and there's a, a, a beautiful uh, a description of, of uh, matters between these two factions. In some cases, these people did not hesitate to use the Grand Vizier or the head of the police to intimidate, arrest, and violently punish their opponents. The lifestyles of the court Jews and their likes differed greatly from that of most of their brethren, imitating that of Ottoman elite with which they were acquainted, acquainted and to which they aspired to resemble. Men and women dwelled in houses or villas, some of which were located on the shores of the Bosphorus, as Mina Rosen had shown, and were decorated in Ottoman style. They dressed as upper class and, and, court, uh, and Muslims and courtiers. They spoke fluent Turkish and headed similar households and uh, clientele networks. Notwithstanding, they financed Torah study and printing of rabbinic literature and established and maintained yeshivot in their own houses. So far, I found no evidence of their assisting needy poor who are not scholars or funding regular benevolent, benevolent societies. A comparison to Islamic benevolent, bene, benevolence, which materialized in various endowments, works, ranging from building mosques, water fountains, health care, and soup kitchens, and subsidizing Quran readers, stresses the narrow venues which the Jewish courtiers chose, mostly benefiting local rabbinic elite. <clears throat> Two questions arise. The first is what motivated one to achieve that risky post? And the second concerns the motives for investing in communal matters. Why then did certain Jews make such an effort to win this risky position? They surely knew exactly how dangerous it was and to what degree they were the su subject of hostility and jealousy. Was it just the ambitious drive for power, the prospect of gaining immense riches, or the honor and respect they could expect from everyone even if they were just dhimis? Was it pri privileges that would differentiate them from their, uh, other Jews, riding horses, wearing ex ex expensive clothes and headgear, that marked Muslim uh, dignitaries? Did they desire to become part of a certain milieu, that, uh, that of the elite uh, of the Ottoman society? 
Apparently, we will never be able to answer these questions with, with certainty. Perhaps each person in this role had different pr pretensions and dreams, and yet after a f the first generation of well-established Bazargans, there were already a somewhat binding familiar heritage and ethos. How these, these people aspire to be perceived and how are they supposed to act in front of non-Muslims and uh, Jews? On the other hand, we may also wonder why they bothered at all with the inner politics of the community and with continuously needy Jewish communities of the four, uh, four holy cities in Palestine who are always on the verge of financial collapse. Why did they help rabbis in so many ways, even though their own lives were far from being exemplary uh, from a Jewish point of view? As a matter of fact, why even unofficially represent Jews at court as they did in, in practice? I think it's mostly uh, uh, there is a, a utilitarian motive behind all these things, uh, and it is very unlikely that uh, it was only a, a, a philanthropy or Jewish solidarity. Continuous investment in rabbinic elite, establishing and de dedicating yeshivot, funding and printing of uh, books and the like, probably bought these rabbis who knew perfectly well who paid their salaries and were grateful towards those who enabled them to print their works. Once these people needed the support of a rabbinic authority or appeared before them in the courts, they were certain that they would receive a supportive treatment. Moreover, they were awarded sermons, prayers and public thanksgiving during the Shabbat services in the synagogues as well as flowery thankful praises in the introduction of printed books they funded. Interestingly, and I think not by chance, they are also mentioned as support. They are not mentioned as supporting the poor masses. Is this because there was no serious political gain involved, as the poor were unable to promote their interests? How is it that they did not emulate uh, their Muslim peers in est establishing endowments for the public good? Could this be a proof of their cynical viewpoint and utilitarian attitude to charitable causes? To some degree, this is a bold speculation, but I think I may learn ex silencio that courtiers did not focus their charitable acts on aiding the poor. Moreover, rabbinic literature preserved a dozen rebukes against the stingy rich, who are not specified by the, who they are, uh, who either refused to donate or give, uh, or give very little. As for the only body in which they were clearly active, together with the city's leading rabbis, the Committee of Officers for Palestine, Vat Kideirat Israel, Bekushta, this these bus busy businessmen took part in it and often hosted their emissaries from Palestine because they wanted to control the huge sums of money it was funneling. Until now, no one has really considered the fact, the facet, this facet of the clerk's work. I cannot prove my hi hypothesis, but neither, but their temporary use of the funds earmarked for Palestine as a loan without interest to further their business seem, seems a certainty. I see no other explanation or motive for these uh, continuous efforts, spending time on meetings, letters, and acting regulations on lobbying for Palestine, had it not been for a, a, an important source of cheap credit or free loans that were so vital to cover the constant expenses on a variety of goods. The same goes for the sums collected as tax or extraordinary bribes by the Istanbul Jewish community, who also passed through their hands. To sum up, we can trace influential Jews into Sultan court uh, since the mid-15th century, yet it is only during the 17th century that the function of a purveyor, Bazargan, and banker evolved and Jews rose to such a position due to their mercantile connections and their ability to raise the needed credit to support their economic activity both in the imperial court and in provincial capitals. I try to understand the actions and motivations for their uh, philanthropy. Those who managed to reach this highly and demanding risky post, enjoying great accessibility high, to high-ranking officials, <clears throat> these Jews enjoyed their status and live accordingly, exploiting their position and connections to their own benefit, many times at the expense of other Jews. They were involved in some benevolent activities, but these were mostly semi-philanthropic acts, carefully chosen and intended to ensure their hegemony, by supporters and glorify their, na their name. Their set of values and priorities was, always, uh, was already outside the Jewish community. Neither piety nor compassion for the co co or solidarity guided them. 
These are legitimate assert assertions which, which I hope to, will be proven one day. I can only surmise that those rich uh, people, Gvirim, who only became wealthier, competing with, uh, with each other, provoked envy and hatred among uh, their uh, uh, brothers, as well as pride and feelings of loyalty. So on the one side, they are pride, uh, proud of, of these Jews in court, but also envy them and perhaps complain about them uh, between themselves. Uh, and also feelings of indebtedness and gratitude. Last but not least, the core Jews, the elite of the Jewish community, were also an important agent, mediating and transferring various components from courtly circles marked by their Ottoman Persian culture to the Jewish middle class. The manner which we, in which they study the language, etiquette, proper behavior in court is intriguing and poses questions. They have thus preceded other elites in introducing Ottomanization processes to the Jewish society. Future investigation is needed regarding the connections with court Jews in the Austro-Hungarian and German states. Oriental carpets, jewels, silk, tobacco, coffee, spices and other luxuries were in high demand in Europe and one wonders what was the role of Ottoman Jewish merchants in supplying them. At least one of the most famous court Jews, David Oppenheim, who died in 1736 and uh, in 1702, since 1702 lived in Prague, was an enthusiastic collector of Hebrew manuscripts. What were the mechanisms that brought Ottoman and other Oriental manuscripts to his huge collection? Was there a connection between Ashkenazi and another question? Was there an, another a, a connection between Ashkenazi and Western Sephardi and Turkish merchants and, and suppliers? Uh, between the Ottoman Empire and the West. These questions await further research. Thank you.